right, everybody, welcome to Back in Tunes. That might have been a weird intro, but we're going to be discussing Eon Flux and the Max in a special, I guess, grown-up version of Back in Tunes. I'm your host, Michael, my co-host. Jacob, how y'all doing? <laughs> That's funny, the last episode we recorded, I turned you way, way down. That one, I turned you way, way up. Whoops. Say it loud. <laughs> All right, so this is going to be kind of a shorter episode because Eon Flux and the Max, they kind of aired in smaller chunks than the normal cartoon. But, uh, Jacob, go ahead and let me know what you think about the, the, the show. Well, what I thought about the show, I watched it a lot when I was a kid. I was, it was really intriguing to see. It was very different from everything else I've seen. It's uh, created by Peter Chang, who also created Phantom 2040. He was the character designer on that, and he was also he also did uh, Rain, which was the one about Alexander the Great, same animation style. Yeah, I was kind of confused. I mean, you know, as a kid, you know, prepubescent, getting into it, liking girls at an early age, and you know, I didn't know any. You know, I was kind of turned on by it. I was like, oh shoot, yeah, this is growing BDSM. Well, I think we BDSM all work. were. It's very erotic and weird, and there's some weird tongue stuff going on in a lot of those cartoons. Man, licking nipples, tonguing each other. Oh yeah, kind of gross. Plus, it is. It's MTV. Way. It was part of it was you know it was part of uh, MTV's The Oddities. You know yeah. their little cartoon hour that they would have. Well, it actually, uh, it's like uh, it bounced around different shows. But what I first experienced it on was Liquid Television, which was a half hour show of experimental cartoons. And so that's the first place I saw Beavis and Butthead and Squiggle Vision, or not Squiggle Vision, but it's like these uh, squiggly line drawings of scenes from movies like Night of Living Dead and stuff like that. But then the last right. one was Eon Flux, and I remember just sitting there watching it going, w w wait, what am I watching? That guy just sucked on someone's nipple for a second, and guns yeah. are blasting, and no one's talking. No one's saying anything. Yeah, no, it, it really adds mystery to the characters with no dialogue. It's all really just interpretation. It all started out as short segments, and then eventually, I think one season, it started getting half-hour segments and more dialogue. But I will say this right here. It just seems like I, no matter what future... You live in someone's always like the fashion is going to be BDSM leather I know, vinyl. Right? <laughs> Every movie we look, <laughs> it's either that or it's that uh, almost Nazi style of clothing where it's very sterile, grays and blacks, and there's nothing special about it at all. Exactly that too. Also, I mean that first opening shot, you see that fly buzzing around and it yeah. goes right near that eyeball, and then it gets closed in like a Venus flytrap. Yeah, and that's uh, that's what I was gonna say. I think I actually somehow I start things that I don't finish them. What I was saying was it was an unusual opening because there really isn't a theme song, which almost every cartoon in history has a theme song, and that just kind of like has like a feel. It sets a tone, it, like you're stepping into another world when that, that starts. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think I watched all the first season when it first came out, and I watched all the shorts, but I don't think I ever finished the cartoon. But uh, I don't think it really has an end, does it? I don't think it would only run on for three seasons. I'm not sure if if they just ended it right there or just got canceled. You know what's funny but, is uh, MTV, back when they would have shows, you could have a show on for four or five seasons and you'd only have like 20 episodes. You're like, how is that even possible? Like The State. I thought The State was on forever and ever and ever. It's like, ugh, 25 episodes. Oh, I know. Me too. It was uh, <laughs> The State. That's pretty much where everyone from Reno 911 got their start. Right. Yeah, but this here, I mean, like I said, the visual style, it is exactly like Phantom 2040. Well, and, you know, uh, if you guys are fans of this, um, check out Phantom 2040. We discussed this back at Christmas, and it's it's a really great cartoon. Oh, I know, and it has the same visual, kind of, you know, same character design and visual style, but a lot less erotic. Yeah. <laughs> now, I will say, though, like... Right here, the action and the animation is just great. They re-ran this cartoon non-stop. I mean, I have seen the second episode probably 30 times. Just over and over, it just pop on. And that's the cool thing. Sometimes when a show is a full-length show, you get kind of burned out. But these short little bits and pieces here and there, I'm completely fine with. Yeah. Oh, no, me too. Uh, for me, as a kid, I thought they were just, you know, full-length, you know, half-hour episodes. You know, time goes by so slowly. We don't even grasp the concept of how, fa of how fast it can, it can really go. Right. Unlike adults. What did you think so, yeah, of the movie? Also, 
Oh my god! <laughs> right, I was at the same thing. Even the, yeah, how could uh, even the creator was just really disappointed. It just like yeah, they did not. It's like they 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 may have appreciated my show and loved it, but I did I it's like they did not. I did not see the faith in. Oh gosh, I did not see actual faith in their work. I didn't see anything that any that showed why people love my show in the first place. Right, you know something I, like that along that line. There seems to be a curse, and mostly it's with uh, the women. But whenever an actor wins an award at the you know Academy Award, either supporting or lead. It seems like almost immediately, if there is any sort of breakthrough heat on them, the next movie they do is always some sci-fi, comic book fantasy piece of shit. It's always something that, like, oh, that's an interesting, oh, you guys did not think that out at all. Come on, Catwoman, look at that, you know? It just seems like every time, uh. it, it's, uh, it either does nothing for them, or the next movie is some big budget piece of crap, and you're just like, oh, this is so bad. Oh, no, exactly. I mean, plus, you had, I don't even see how some people could even think that that movie was going to turn out. What was the writers thinking? Plus, they also said studios always make last-minute changes, too, so you kind of have to blame the studios. Yeah, there's no way this, uh, the sexuality was going to be there. Man, there's a lot of tongue going on. Good God. He is, like, I know. her earwax out. That is fucked up. And she looks like she's, uh, yeah, it is. It's like, are, are they genetically modified? What's the deal there? You know, and funny. she she was like she she was starting to get turned on by it too. I mean, look what she was doing with her gun. Yeah, normally we don't cuss on this cartoon or on this show back in tunes, but this is a grown up cartoon. If you're listening to this, you're obviously old enough to tolerate some, yeah, some words because this is messed up. This is a wild, wild cartoon. It is. I mean, they, they and and that movie didn't even break any kind of boundaries or go with that kind of. No, it was or very, did, very it, safe, very boring. I have to tell you this, I never finished the movie. And I'm glad you didn't. Heck, even just 10 minutes was a waste of time. Yeah. It's like it's one of those movies where you're constantly looking at your watch, like, oh, gosh, this movie over. I don't want to waste my money. Yeah, I don't want to leave so early. The best parts were in the trailer, and guess what? The trailer wasn't that appealing. Exactly. Yeah. There, there I know. Was, it's like, I just don't understand what it is that after they get an Academy Award, are they just going for a paycheck? Or are they going to give them more exposure by doing a big studio film? I appreciate an actor who wins an Oscar and then just uh, just tries to do the best movie they can. Doesn't matter if they think they're going to get an Academy Award. Doesn't mean it, it, they're looking for box office. Just something that they themselves really want to make. Not what their manager and agents are pressuring them to do. Right. Now, this right here, this was, I think, from what we could tell earlier... Just seems like this. The guy just like cut his finger open and he let that bug in. It's like he's it's, uh, and from what you can tell from the news clippings, it's like some big virus outbreak, uh -huh. and it's spreading. And now he's like bringing it. And now this guy here ha seems to have his own agenda by you know poisoning that billionaire in the bed, that old billionaire in the bed. What is that? Which thing of course is her target away? as well. Huh? What is that thing doing to her? It's like jostling him back and forth. Is it massaging? What the hell is that? Yeah, it's like a, like maybe spinal treatment. Uh, I don't know. Like, yeah. yeah. Keeping the, their yeah. back nice and... The animation on MTV was obviously very, very low budget, so you can see a lot of recycled animation here, but it's still very unique. Peter Chung had a very direct vision, and uh, he never compromised on that vision. Not at all, no. They didn't compromise on anything on the MTV show. No, MTV was this really... Is what, I think MTV was really cool. Yes, they didn't have the money to give you huge budgets, but they always gave you pretty much 100% freedom to do whatever you wanted. All right. And look what they did with Beavis and Butthead. Well, so, there, right there's, here... Uh, there's yeah. some other ones like Clone High. Uh, um, Ren and Stimpy. Uh, what's the one? The Brothers Grunt from the creator Ren and Stimpy. You know, there's some great stuff oh, going yeah. on during that time period. And MTV doesn't show music videos, and nor do they have a TV show worth a damn anymore. Oh, of course not. It's all just garbage. I don't even know how you can call it MTV anymore. Uh-oh, she's about to get shit going. Then, lo and behold, uh, stabbed in the back of the heel. And... Oh. I know, that was so weird. Like, 
the main character already died just like that? In the first episode, what the hell? How did I never get I that before? I don't know. I must have never actually but watched the very end of this. And she just got disintegrated. I guess this is her home. Oh, wow. Well, they definitely thought this through, should anything happen. I think it's funny that this is the far-flung future, and yet they still have film cameras. <laughs> exactly. I know, no, no floating little robots or anything. So I'm guessing, oh, so I'm guessing that purple stuff was the cure. Yeah. And now they're mass-producing it. And like I guess that whole billionaire died. Yeah, that guy, he looks like Rutger Howard from uh, Blade Runner. He does, kind of. Yet, right here, we see A on Flux in some kind of dreamscape. Oh, getting her. go with tongues. More tongues. More t with Dr. Manhattan. <laughs> yeah, and now, now she's a foot fetish model? <laughs> It is. It does kind of throw you off a bit, and it speculates. I guess this is the kind. Of, this is how I felt after watching Lost for the first time. It's a very strange cartoon, but I, I am impressed by its uniqueness. And I mean, obviously, it has a following for a reason. I mean, we wouldn't even be discussing this right now because it probably would have just done this, and that was it. You know, it never made it to a full series. Oh gosh, I said Peter Chang didn't, earlier, didn't I? I can't remember. I hope I didn't. All right, Otherwise so that's like it for us with Eon <laughs> Flux. Let's go and discuss the Max. We're going to take a break real quick, and we'll kick it into gear okay, with the Max. Most of us inhabit at least two worlds. The real world, where we're at the mercy of circumstance, and the world within, the unconscious, a safe place where we can escape. The Max shifts between these worlds against his will. Here, homeless, he lives in a box in an alley. The only one who really cares for him is Julie Winters, a freelance social worker. But in Pangea, the other world, he rules the Outback and is the protector of Julie, his jungle queen. There, he cares for her, but he always ends up back in the real world. And me, old Mr. Gorn, <laughs> only I can see that the secret which unites them could destroy them. I could be helpful. Ah, screw it. I think I'll have some fun with them first. <laughs> So we're talking about the Max now. Um, the Max is another really strange one, and it's from MTV. And uh, I don't know, Jacob, what do you feel about this cartoon? I don't know. As a kid, I was very confused, but I liked it. I mean, you know, to me, he was just like this big purple superhero that would travel between his. I thought it was his home world and then the real world, but it's not. Like I said, it's just a dream world. It definitely has to, to you know, touch. On the subject of subconsciousness and alternate, you know, realities, par you know, parallel dimensions, to an extent, but at the same, but the animation, I kid you not, was is still really out there. I think this is something that could still hold up to today. Oh yeah, um, I first heard of the Max. I had been reading Incredible Hulk like religiously for like two hundred issues, right. and there's a run of the Incredible Hulk. I think it's around three sixty area. Uh, where Sam Keith was the artist, and I at the time I didn't appreciate it, but then I would go back and revisit it, and every year I was like, "Wow, this is something really strange and unusual," and I'm kind of getting into it. And then he quit, and then he went over to Image Comics, and Image Comics had already done its big launch with Savage Dragon, Spawn, and stuff like that, and he came in kind of like the second run of like hot comics with the Max, and I saw it, and it was just one of the wildest things I'd ever seen in my life. And the cartoon came out yeah. and just pushed. It, it's all Sam Q was all about pushing boundaries of what was possible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right here. Oh god, you know, this is a horrible scene right here. Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, this girl, this, you know, even though I mean, it doesn't matter whether she's a sex worker or not. I mean, she. I'm not sure if he's like beating the crap out of her and robbing her, or actually, you know. Assaulting her yeah. sexually. And then the Max comes in and, you know, he looked like nothing else in comic books. Almost every character in Image would remind you in one way or another, either either was intentional or unintentional, of a Marvel character. And you look at him and you go, no, he is completely unique. There is nothing like the Max. Yeah, I know. But uh, what I thought was pretty funny, how he's like, you think it's a narration and all of a sudden it's like, oh, crap, I'm talking out loud again. Yeah. 
And then this scene here, I was like, who was that villain just now? The one that just took out that girl. But no, yeah, the Max was definitely original. And plus, he doesn't. He has uh, how he communicates is so strange because he has no mouth. He has no lower jaw. He just has giant, giant rabbit buck teeth. Yeah, I know, but look right here. You know, you can definitely tell they put in some uh, live animation shadow screen up against. Yeah, it's yeah, uh, just really it, colors the background. Well, what it feels like is Ralph Bakshi. Uh, he was a, exactly. Yeah, he broke grounds with. Uh, well, he didn't ever had much money, so he had to think of clever ways of getting an image across. And he did rotoscoping and mixing live action with animation. You know, and, and it was very unusual at the time, but it was also groundbreaking. And the Max seems to be heavily influenced in what Ralph Bakshi was attempting to do. Because, like I said, Marvel's very, very low budget. But by being low budget, you could really go edgy. Oh, indeed. But right here, as far as it goes with Max, it's like he doesn't just dream. It's like he thinks he's in another world. He's so sure. Yeah. As if he himself is just jumping between parallel dimensions and nobody's aware of it. Yeah, the uh, comic but, book lasted for 35 issues and uh, the cartoon, I think, lasted 13. Yeah, 13 episodes. So that's it's kind of surprising because most uh, cartoons are just a sliver of what the comic book's existence is. Right. Right here, I mean, uh, you know, earlier... Uh, the narration, you know, Pangea, I was like, whoa, was he something, you know, prehistoric way before? Is that where he existed? Is that where he came from? Like, pre, like you know, before uh, Neanderthals and, man, you know, modern caveman and... You know, it's just, like, you know, his origins are just a huge mystery. I never thought that this was available. I thought YouTube would be the only way to watch it, but um, you can order the entire series, manufacture on demand through Amazon, um, and those contain commentary to each episode by Sam Keith and the director, Greg Bonzo, which that's cool if you're a huge fan, grab that. Oh, definitely. Oh, so right, yeah. And plus, you know, bringing in a, a female character, you know, a female character like this, I think also, you know, to have someone the Max can relate to or can connect to somehow. Yeah, also, at the same time, I think she also had some, like, you know, definitely some, you know. Oh, gosh, I, I, I'm sorry. I lost my train of thought. No, it's okay. I'm kind of looking up, seeing what else uh, Sam Keith is up to these days since that ended. He's been working on Judge Dredd, uh, 30 Days of Night. Uh, he did covers for a comic book written by Anthrax, the band. Wow. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, he's been doing some Batman here and there. Zero Girl for the same company. Though I've never heard of that one. Oh, you know what? I read his other series. He wrote a series kind of has like, it's not connected to the Max, but it has like that feel of the Max called Scratch. Uh, it was about werewolves. Oh, wow. I'll have to look into that. Oh, wow. Like I said, there's just so much mystery surrounding the characters. Except her, she seems like, you know, a good, a do-gooder freelance, you know, social worker. Yeah. And yet she's comfortable in what she's wearing. And, of course, everyone around her is going to be a sexist prick. Of course. Oh, gosh. I know. That's, you know, that was a huge, I mean, that was definitely a subject to be tackled in this cartoon. Because in a minute when she goes up to the, you know, the guy at the uh, office to get the max out of, the, out of jail... You know, you listen to his dialogue and what he says, and you can tell straight up he's a sexist prick. Well, I'm looking at some of the other writers on the comic book, and he only had two other creators come in during that 35 episodes or 35 issues. Uh, Alan Moore, of course, being insanely influential, oh, one wow. of the greatest writers of all time. So you know he had some uh, interest in something as quality as the Max in order to come along because Alan Moore does, doesn't just jump on anything. He's not really a gun for hire. Oh, yeah, I know. I mean, Alan Moore, I mean, if he's really interested, he will, like, if he really wants to be a part of something, he will reach over the desk and, like, grab you and shake you. 
And the other person was William Mesner Lopes, and William Mesner Lopes isn't talked about much, but there was a period where he was really killing it on The Flash and Impulse, which is Kid Flash. Uh, he did a really great job on that kind of stuff, and after that, he kind of he kind of went off the radar. He started doing more independent stuff. I don't know what he's doing now, but uh, all three yeah. are really great guys. Okay, yeah. No. Listen, I, I, seriously, did you just hear what that cop said though? Like saying, like, oh, you know, we're dressed like that. You're sending off the wrong signals. No, she's not. Just because she's dressed like that doesn't mean she's asking for it, asshole. No, yeah, that's the thing about. Uh, I mean, what is that about the clothing? Is it because you think of the sexual parts just so close to being seen and that gives you an erection? And all of a sudden, that allows you to say, you know what, you were asking for it. No, actually, no. And they could say that about anything. I mean, there was there, there was an article about a year and a half ago about a woman who was uh, just walking in, like, baggy sweatpants and a frumpy uh, hoodie or whatever, and she still got attacked. And, I know. Uh, it has nothing to do with what you're wearing. And I don't understand why people treat why you get treated in a certain way based on how you're dressed. And I think that's a little bit about the Max because he looks a certain way that you expect him to be a monster, a true monster. But it, it, it's, uh, it, it's a stupid rule. I mean, you could have someone, I and mean, look at Lex Luthor. He's a perfect example of someone who looks clean cut, clean cut, professional, a, a good person, yet he's almost one of the most evil people on the planet, though he doesn't believe he is. You know, it's, it's a weird very juxtaposition based on imagery. Right, and also, like, I mean, you know, rapists cause rape. Nobody else. All right, so we don't want to end this on a sad note. Uh, that was kind of a, it, Both cartoons are more mature and more sophisticated, so uh, I apologize if this episode kind of turned you off because we went darker than normal, but it's just going to happen. We can't just talk about little kid cartoons. We need to evolve into other things. And animation for grown-ups is actually really ignored, and I think it's kind of stupid. Overseas... Animation is for grown-ups. A lot of animation is for grown-ups. Yet in America, we treat it as if it's solely for comedy, only if it's for grown-ups, or kiddie stuff. You don't see a whole lot of action or sophisticated stuff for people above the age of 12. Well, sadly, no, we don't. I mean, there was also... Um... Spawn. Well, there was... Spawn is one of the darkest yeah, cartoons Spawn. I've ever seen. That was one of the most brutal cartoons I've ever seen. My mom let me watch that as a kid. Of course, I didn't freak out. I wasn't too freaked out. My mom was just, you know, just like, whatever. I know my son's not going to, you know, go off being a murderous vigilante. Right. Or a, you know, demon child. <laughs> In one way, I probably was. I don't know. There, you know, it was just three boys growing up, you know, raising three sons, you know, each a year apart. Yeah, it was pretty tough. We were pretty tough and quite rowdy. <laughs> oh, that's good. Um, all right, everybody. So that's it for us here at Back in Tunes. Check us out. We just built a new page solely devoted to Back in Tunes with awesome artwork by my friend Ron. And um, I should say editing is now being done. I guess I want to say audio production value is being added <laughs> by uh, Jemetsko.com. Uh, Jemetsko is a really cool. It's Andrew Bargeron. He basically designs these awesome T-shirts that we both have. And uh, he does comic book here and there, and he does really great audio design. He was in a band called uh, Station, and I want to thank I want to thank him. He takes no pay from me for the promotion. You know, we kind of trade off. But if you're looking for someone to do some audio fixing on a podcast or recording, seriously, he's the guy to go to. Go to Jemetsko.com. G I M E T Z. I think I screwed up. Z T. -Z. You know what? He'll fix this. <laughs> I'm saying it. <laughs> J-M-E-T-C-O. Oh, yeah, I think, yeah, C-O.com. Dot right. com, Sorry. yes. Woo, you know how to spell, I do not. Plus, there's some really cool shirts on there, too. Yeah. All right, everybody, thank you again for all your support. We're getting some episodes out there again. I can't believe how people reacted to Bundar the Barbarian. Seriously, the most insanely popular episode I've ever had. This show was on for like one year. And I know so many people want more of it. Oh, gosh. I mean, if they're bringing back Masters of the Universe as a live-action movie, who knows what they'll do with Thundar the Barbarian. Yeah, a lot of these cartoons, they could use a, a return, at least a special. You know, hey, who, who doesn't want to see that? And we don't want to see any more crappy video, directed video movies. We don't want to see any big-budget, bloated nonsense that has nothing to do with the cartoon. If you're going to buy the rights to turn into a movie, stick to the origins. You know, stick to I the know. plot. I know, just, I mean, hopefully, hopefully Robert Rodriguez gets that right with uh, Fire and Ice. 
I hope. I hope he actually gets it made because he's not a hot commodity right now. You know, we should really do yeah. a, a Ralph Bakshi episode because he made five or six really great movies, a few crappy ones, but he is so influential. Um, let us oh, yeah. I mean, to he... cover that, man. That sounds awesome. Oh, definitely. We should do that. Especially the, I mean, for me, what really got me into Ralph Bakshi was the Lord of the Rings animated movies. Yeah, mine was American Pop. Uh, we could do that. We could do Don Bluth. Um, a couple other guys that like, did the movies. We should only do that. All right, um, we're kind of winding out here. Um, thank you, everybody, for your support, and uh, I'm signing off. All right, good night, everybody. Namaste and good luck. Me, 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 me,